All right, good evening, everyone. Can, can, can everybody hear me? It's a pretty, pretty big room, pretty massive. All right, cool. So Python and Lambda, man. Um, so first of all, everything on the talk is available in that GitHub repo, all the code and everything else, even the slide deck. So you don't have to do anything, you don't have to take photos. You can if you want to, but you don't have to, right? So allow me to introduce myself. Well, um, <laughs> I like Python and I like Lambda, and I share the first name with a very good guitarist from a very great rock band, and this is it. But you might be asking, why Python and why Lambda, right? Cool. So let's talk about that one at a time. So why Lambda? This is, um, this is Kelsey Hightower. Kelsey Hightower is like, uh, he's like the Jedi master. He's the Obi-Wan Kenobi of the Kubernetes world. And this is him at KubeCon. So Kubernetes is a Google product. KubeCon, he's wearing his Google t-shirt, but he's talking about Lambda. Lambda is gold standard, you know, serverless functions today. It's not the only one. You've got Azure Functions and Google Cloud Functions, and they're pretty good, but Lambda is pretty gold standard. So that's one. That's why Lambda. Okay. Why Python? In the serverless world, you know, uh, JavaScript is the firstborn son <laughs> of this world. Everybody talks about JavaScript. Here's a Python thing, and here's the here's our serverless thing, and here's the JavaScript function. I vote for it. Um, but at least in, in AWS, at least in AWS Lambda, Python can do everything JavaScript can do. You can't write Cloudflare workers with Python and Cloud Functions has some limitation. But in AWS Lambda, you can do everything in Python that you can do in JavaScript, which basically is everything, right? So we might not be the firstborn son of Lambda. It's still JavaScript. But we are at least firstborn princess. <laughs> yeah? So in 2017, I built a website. Now, I'm, a, I'm an architect. So what that means is I don't know how to code. Uh, but I could build a website like or something like that. So over the course of a week, and at peak, it was about 2,000 concurrent users. Um, and in about a short, let's say, three to five hour period, about half a million API hits, OK? The total cost of building the website and total cost to run it and serve all of that was about $5. Um, two of those $5 is the cost of serving the background image through CloudFront. <laughs> so Lambda itself was quite cheap. It was actually in the free tier. Um, but that's, not, that's just the infra cost. In all your projects, in most projects, your payroll cost far exceeds infrastructure. The fact that I could do this on my own without understanding the details, intricacies of Apache or MySQL for under $5 is pretty awesome, right? The, the API hits a database with about 47 million rows, by the way. Um, and that's another thing about serverless. You don't have to worry about servers or scaling. The platform takes care of it for you, OK? So, Depending on how good or proficient you are in Lambda, you might be on a different scale. So the talk's divided into four stages, and hopefully there's something for everyone. All right? We start you off, and I got a demo. <laughs> Hope it works. Um, but that's going to initiate you into Lambda. Then we go to Padawan and Knight and Master. And there's going to be a lot of Star Wars references in this talk. And if you don't know Star Wars, well, <laughs> that's going to be an issue. All right. Um, so before we go into the demo, tools of the trade, very important. So how many of you all know Terraform? Yeah, Terraform's awesome, man. Terraform is cool for provisioning infrastructure. And you might ask, you know, what's infrastructure in the serverless world? There is still infrastructure. It's just you don't care about the underlying server itself. So I use Terraform to provision S3 buckets. I use Terraform to provision DynamoDB tables and SQS queues and SNS queues, et cetera. If you know AWS, that's the, that's the terminology. But Terraform's really great because you can do things like taint and force destroy, which you know, other platforms can't do. Now, then I use serverless to deploy the Lambda functions and the API gateway. And the reason for that is if you ever try to do that in Terraform, your Terraform script will be longer than your Lambda function. Um, serverless is just a much better framework for abstracting a lot of that away from you. So you can do a full-blown API, and we'll see that in a bit, in about 40 lines of code, right? With everything set up. Um, yeah, so let's go straight into it. So um, does this mic work? OK, it works. I'm going to do that. Put this down for a while. OK, if I escape, can you hear me? Yeah, OK. All right, so escape that. Um, whew. OK, hopefully that works. Yes. All right, into terminal. We're going to have a demo via terminal. OK, so let's go to that. So we're in, uh, this is in the GitHub repo, by the way, and you can take a look at it. So inside this folder, I have, well, let's take a look. Three files. There's two Python files, and there's a serverless YAML file. All right? And because I'm a bit of a madman, <laughs> I'm going to now 
uh, as a live demo, modify a Python file using Nano. <laughs> so just to prove that it's me, can somebody just shout out a song or a phrase that they want to put here? Anybody now? May the force be with you. Awesome, man. May the force be with you. Thank you. Let's put some exclamation marks. OK, so let's save that. Now, this is going to take a while because it uses. So I'm going to just deploy that, and we're going to come back out, right? So let me just deploy that first. And the internet is a bit wanky. So let's, I'm just going to wait for it to start, and then we can break up. OK, cool. So let's open another terminal. Let's go back into that uh, thing. OK. Code sample, 0, 01, yeah. All right. So <clears throat> let's see what we did. So this is goodbye. So now it's got may the force be with you. It's a very simple function. Everybody in Python knows what this is. Returns a JSON structure that says may the force be with you, right? If I do cat hello. And by the way, can, can you guys see the font behind? Yeah, cool. I increased it to it's very large. OK, so and then we got a hello function. It does the same thing, but it responds back with hello, right? Very cool. So none of that is magic. Where the magic really happens is in our serverless YAML file. This is a file from the serverless framework. OK, now if I scroll up, you can see here I'm saying, hey, serverless, I'm going to want to spin up an AWS Lambda function in AP Southeast 1. So that's uh, Singapore, right? Yeah. And Python 3.7. So far, so good. There's two functions here. Let me just scroll down so it's nice. There's two functions. There's a hello function and a goodbye function. This is the cloud functions we're talking about now, yeah? And the important thing is the handler. So what it says is that when the hello function, when the hello cloud function gets invoked, run the code that's in the hello py file and run the main function there. Or another way, run the main function in the hello py file. Okay, and similarly for goodbye, run the main function in the goodbye.py file. That's the handler, that's what it runs, okay? Now, these three variables here, this is very important. This is the o memory size is the only way you can configure how fast or how slow the Lambda runs. Memory size starts at 120 megabytes. The more memory you give it, the more CPU comes together, and you pay more for the function to run, right? And that's the one variable you have to make your Lambda go faster or slower from a, from a let's say, a physical infrastructure perspective. It's going to allocate you more percentage of cores and more memory. Then I have timeout. And timeout is more like a control. Basically, it says that if the function doesn't complete in 10 seconds, kill it. Okay, Even if it doesn't complete, just kill it. If it completes, well and good. But after 10 seconds, kill the function. And finally, concurrency. Concurrency means that I uh, reserve 10 invocations for this function. So I'm guaranteed that there will always be enough space in my account to run 10 of these functions in parallel, at the same time, simultaneously. Now, it also means that I can't do 11. I'm limiting it to 10. This is a little bit, but we'll see why later. It's a very good reason why. We'll look at it later. Now, this last bit is where magic really happens. I'm saying this function, make it an API at this part, API v1 hello, for the get method. And for goodbye, if you look at it, I'm allocating more resources to goodbye, 256 instead of 128. I can allocate per endpoint. Because here I got three endpoints. Say, every time a request comes in on the API at v1 goodbye or at v1 hello, Right? So if I get v1 goodbye, or I post a v1 goodbye, the same function runs. But if I post a hello, I run goodbye. So if I get API v1 hello, I'll run this hello function. And if I post API v1 hello, I get the other function. I can do all these kind of things because I'm configuring it here. Right? So let's go back and hope my function completed. Yep, wonderful. So you can see right there, uh, if I can get my mouse. I already have these APIs. So this is the API endpoint. Now, it doesn't look like a nice URL. You can make it pretty, or you can put CloudFront in front of it to make it your custom domain. But let's just copy that, right? OK, let's copy that. Oof, oof, sorry. Yeah. Um, OK. So if I curl that from here, you can see it ran hello. Instead, if I, let's say, post it from here, post, it will run goodbye. May the force be with you. Yeah, so that's deploying an API with that 38 lines of code. No Flask, no Django, no having to deal with Apache Web Service, no and anything else. All of that runs on the platform. The platform is doing the work for us. Um, so let me just curl goodbye as well. Uh, so if I just go up, yeah, and then just modify that to goodbye, that should work. Okay, and I'm going to curl that a few times, and you'll see why in a bit. Okay, uh, let's do hello as well. All right, so. 
All of that runs great. So I use serverless to do, um, and I've actually configured some, uh, what do you call this, zero configuration monitoring on the serverless framework. So they give you a nice little thing here for all the invocations. Let me refresh this page. Hopefully Nintendo works. <laughs> it's a bit slow. Let's hope it works. Uh, yeah. So you can see all of the invocations that I just did in the last 15 minutes. So all of this happened just now. You can see how long those invocations took. You can see how much memory they used and whether it was a cold start or not. If you don't know what a cold start is, don't worry, we covered that later on. So this is pretty awesome, it's pretty cool. You can only do this for Python and JavaScript functions and serverless currently, but it basically, you can spin up the API without worrying about anything. I didn't even pip install anything. It was just code deployed, right? So, well, I technically I pip install AWS, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's go back to our slide. That's the demo, thank God it worked. Um, and resume the slideshow. Uh, and also let me go back to, yeah. Okay, so in conclusion, we spun up an API before your eyes, yeah? That 38 lines of code spun up the, that 38 lines of code and the function is all you need to spin up the API, right? That's really cool. That API has HTTPS, so I don't have to do Let's Encrypt, I don't have to do anything, I don't have to worry about web server configurations, it has it already, okay? Each API resource, so slash API slash v1 slash hello, or slash API slash v1 slash goodbye, each of those resources has a resource allocation for it per invocation. It's not 120 megabytes for everything that comes in, it's 120 megabytes per HTTP request that is allocated to it, right? So every user that comes is gonna get the same type of experience. You don't have to do it, right? Um, we can split the resource by HTTP method, Okay, so we can do post and get and then split those across different functions. Um, we can do it at different programming languages. So I use tree seven, but in theory, because the functions are so unique or so independent, you could have some functions on three six, some functions on three seven, some functions on two seven if you like, or you can even go crazy and have Ruby and Java and even what we call custom runtime functions. So Rust and Bash, right? The point is not Python, the point is the Lambda itself. Um, what we didn't see was what we didn't see was pro permission, sorry. Uh, so my mistake, let me just go back. I just wanna show you permissions for a while. Um, yeah, so hopefully that works. Okay, um, back on the screen, yeah, clear that up. Okay, so if I go to another form. So here, you can see there's two functions, download config no privs right here, and download config and they reference the same handler. So download config in handler dot main. So same, same function is running, same memory size, same everything. The difference is the IAM role statement. IAM is identity and access management in AWS. It is the permission of the function to run. And this particular says, I think, for the download config function, granted the permission to get an object from my S3 bucket. And I'm actually very specific. I say get, only allow it to get the config.json object. So if it tries to get anything else, it's gonna fail. But since these are two of the same functions, in theory, one should work and one should fail. And one of the beauties about serverless framework is we can invoke it directly from my command line. So I'm gonna invoke download config. It should work, hopefully. And it's gonna download some JSON file and, and spit it out, there you go. Uh, and then now, if I download config, what is it, no privs? Yeah, I hope so. No privs, so no privileges it will spit out a very ugly um, error message. There we go. If you scroll right up here, you'd see something about get head object or something like that. Here we go. So error occurred 403. This is a pretty bad message, but basically what it is is I have two of the same functions. One I have given permission to access a bucket and one I have not. So it's not like you have one app that shares privileges for your database and for your stores, etc. Every resource, every endpoint in your API can be given a different permission set so that if one of them gets compromised, they can only maximize or access things that that specific endpoint can access. Your security guys will love you for this. <laughs> um, right, so let's go back, let's resume the slideshow, and let's take that out. Okay, but so far you're not impressed. You know, most of it is let the knife do the work. So in serverless, a lot of the times we consume resources, we consume services and offerings from AWS, right? and we let them do the work. So we don't spin up our own web server. We don't you know, build our own certificates, et cetera. We let the platform do the work. That is what, that's the most important thing we have to take away from this because the more you let the platform do the work, the more you can focus on writing code that delivers value to your business, right? But you, know, you can do this in a Flask app probably, in a Django app, you're not impressed. 
So let's get a bit deeper and understand what serverless actually is. So before that, one caveat, reInvent is coming. Um, so if you want to be scared about innovation, just look at what AWS launch and reInvent every year. It's like 100 different services, 100 different things. And some of the things I tell you today may be irrelevant you know, when reInvent comes along. So if six months from now, someone comes and tells you something and you say, yeah, some guy at PyCon told me I couldn't do it. <laughs> well, it's probably because of this. Serverless is evolving very quickly. In fact, one of the tools I'm going to show you is about 48 hours old, right? So imagine you got your serverless function and it deployed some code to AWS. And this code is like an egg laying on a leaf. And one Sunday morning, that code gets invoked. So let's say it's an API gateway call. Um, something's come and invoke the function. That function now has to respond. So that's still code. It's not a, it's not a running uh, process yet. So what AWS does is it launches something called the execution context. Right? So Caterpillar pops up, goes nom nom noing, and then creates the execution context. What really happens is your code gets extracted. They create a container using Firecracker, I think. It was Amazon's proprietary thing, but it's open source, um, and creates an execution context. That's the container that's going to actually work on the data you're going to give it. That piece from code to execution context is called bootstrap time, sometimes called init time. Okay. This is important because that execution context is the thing that actually will run. That's where your function is running, right? That's where the event data gets pumped into. So if you want to consume things off an SQS queue or you want to uh, consume the API, for example, so API request came in, that's where the part parameters and the query string parameters and the message body get pumped into the execution context. Once you pass the execution context, that executes and the function completes. This is pretty straightforward. What people, what new people to, to Lambda sort of realize is that AWS has already spun up this execution context for you. There's no point killing it if the next invocation is coming in just right after this. So they actually keep the execution context around. So your butterfly actually revolt, it reverts back to become a cocoon, right? And your next invocation is going to hit the execution context directly without bootstrapping. It's very important because now without that, it's going to be much faster. The event data gets pumped straight into it, and you execute directly. Oh, sorry. Can you see? OK. So it goes straight there. Event data gets hit, and then the execution time happens. So you have bypassed bootstrap time for your second invocation. right? So of course, there's an important question. Now that you know that this is the behavior of Lambda, how do you write more efficient, effective code? Now, AWS tells you, don't worry about it. You just write Python, and we'll take care of the rest. That's true. If you just write Python, they will take care of the rest. But if you knew exactly how Lambda runs, you can write more effective code for it. You can write more efficient code. For example, if you know this, you know that, well, I may have 10,000. If you spin up a Lambda 10 times in parallel right now, then you get 10 execution contexts. If you spin up a Lambda 10 times, but one after the other, so one and then completes, and then two, and then three, and then four, you'll get one execution context. So that one execution context was reused 10 times. By knowing that, it makes more sense to actually move stuff across, right? So that you reduce your execution time, which happens a lot, and maybe you take a li little hit on your bootstrap time, which happens only once per execution context, right? So that you only get that one hit once, and then you can, for the next few hours, run really, really fast executions. So the question, of course, if you've done Lambda, how do you do this? How do you move code from execution time to bootstrap time, right? So very simple. So you got a function like this. It's a main function, and it runs, OK? Uh, and it's reading some, what is it doing? Oh, it's reading some data from a config JSON file in an S3 bucket. Pretty standard stuff. This will run on every invocation, because it's in your main function. So the main function runs at every invocation, and it does that. But the config JSON is, let's say, a static file. You don't need to read it on every invocation. You can do it in Bootstrap once, and then execute all the way. And the way you do that is just you do that. You move that code out of the handler, and now that bit of code runs on Bootstrap, and that bit of code runs on execution time. The difference is quite remarkable. So here we go. This is the serverless data I showed you before. If you look, I've invoked um, five times a function called outside handler, and then five times a function called inside handler. There's one cold start for each. A much simpler graph will be something like this. So you can see that if you put that code outside the handler, it gets executed once, that very big, you know, on, the, on your right, the very big cold start. But every other time, it won't. It's very, very short, very fast. 
If you put it inside the handler, it's going to execute every time. If you look at just the execution time, neglect the bootstrap time, it looks like this, right? Because you pay per second of execution in Lambda, or per 100 milliseconds actually, this actually is not just faster, it's cheaper, much, much cheaper. You should avoid doing stuff inside the handler if you don't have to. So there's three places you can put data. Now the data depends on the event, so you need to look at the actual data that's hit by the API. You have to do the execution time, you've got no choice. But if it doesn't, you've got three choices of where to put it. You can put it as an environment variable inside a Lambda. So when you deploy, you can actually set the environment variables of the Lambda function. Uh, you can put it outside the handler, or you can put it inside the handler, right? And that's basically what it is. And we just discussed, right? So if you put it outside the handler, it gets invoked once when the function spins up, and then after that, never again. If you put it inside the handler, every invocation of the function is going to use it. Now, because of that, environment variables are very fast, outside the handler, medium, inside the handler, very slow, because it's executing every time. And that translates to a much higher cost. Now, not just the cost of the lambda. So if you put it inside the handler and you hit the S3 bucket on every invocation, you're going to pay not just for running the Lambda, which is usually quite cheap. You're going to have to pay for dragging that stuff out of S3. So S3 has a request or hitting secrets manager or parameter store or something like that. So you should never, ever put stuff inside the handler unless it's event data specific. So finally, if you want to change the variable, if you want to change config.json, how would you do it? So with environment variables, you have to deploy again. Outside the handler, it's minutes or hours. Now, this is where it gets a bit tricky, right? So it's AWS Lambda is this platform thing that um, AWS don't really open up the units to show you. So you have to make some guesses about how it actually runs. Um, no one has an actual definitive answer about this, but generally speaking, if, you're, if the function is being invoked over and over and over again, consistently over a time, the execution context can last hours, five to seven hours. If nothing is hitting the execution context, not getting invoked at all, it will get killed in about five to 15 minutes. So roughly minutes or hours. It's a bit you know, uncertain. And finally, if you put it inside the handler, yep, that's near instantaneous, but it's very expensive and it's very slow. Cool. So another question you might ask, well, can't we actually also reduce bootstrap time, maybe by reducing the size of our code? Um, no. <laughs> it used to be, maybe it's the case, but for now, at least in Python, you know, whether the functions, this is two functions, one's a couple of bytes and one's got extra 49 megabytes inside of it. The size of the function doesn't really matter. The invocation time is roughly the same, so don't, don't even bother. Um, and here, inside the same .py file, we have two functions, one called before and one called after. And between before and after, you've got 10,000 lines of print, world, uh, print hello world statements, right? And even then, yeah, you can see maybe after is slightly slower than before. But if you look at the scale, it's talking about five milliseconds, five to seven milliseconds. Lambda is not built for these high time-sensitive things anyway. You should be able to take a five to 10 millisecond hit on your functions. So it's not the best way to go looking for efficiency. What you really want to do is focus your effort on moving as much code that is not event dependent from your execution time to bootstrap. So remember that Lambda keeps its execution context, right? There's a bootstrap time and an execution time but you should always try to reduce execution time first before trying to go for bootstrap. That gives you the best bang for buck, right? Cool. Now, now you know a lot. No, okay. But let's go a little bit deeper. Let's become, you know, Jedi Knights on this thing. So let's think about this. You've got a Lambda function. It pops into existence when the event happens, okay? Uh, so what event? Well, it could be an API request, could be something hits a queue, something appears in a bucket, or even something gets hit on DynamoDB. That event will automatically trigger the Lambda to it. The Lambda itself doesn't have data, so it might have to go and get input data from somewhere. So again, an S3 bucket or a DynamoDB table, and it's going to output data again to an S3 bucket or a DynamoDB table or whatever. Shortly after, the Lambda dies, assuming it's asynchronous. If it's synchronous, it will respond to the event and then it will die. Uh, and then after it dies, maybe a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes later, it writes out logs to CloudWatch. So you can actually go in there and take a, take a look at your logs, right? But that's got a slight delay to when that happens, right? The important thing about this slide is that all of this happens over the network. That's a network interface, right? When I was young, we learned in computer science 101, cache is faster than RAM, RAM is faster than disk, disk is faster than network. Network is the slowest thing around, and this runs everything over the network. You cannot mount, or at least not yet, <laughs> you cannot mount uh, an EVS or an EFS store. You cannot mount fast storage in this thing. Just can't. 
uh, and you cannot have XSH access. You have no XSH access, zero, right? You can do a reverse shell if you're a little bit hacky, but yeah, you don't have an SSH access. You're running as like a sandbox user, so it's very low privilege user. You don't get root, you don't get nothing on this thing, so it's very difficult. But now that we know this is roughly how it works, how can we use this data to write better code? Cool, take a look. Inside your Lambda function, there is memory and there is disk. Yes, there is disk. You get 512 megabytes in a slash temp directory. That is the only directory you can write to during runtime of Lambda. Cool. But that disk is not like what you would consider in the container world. In, a, in the container world, uh, you've got this container, you mount a volume, and then maybe you unmount and you mount it to another container. The volume of persistent store lasts way longer than the container. It's persistent storage. In this world, the disk in the Lambda function dies when the execution context dies. It goes with it. So that disk on the Lambda function cannot be considered permanent storage. You cannot keep stuff there in the hopes of retrieving it later on. It's very unpredictable. So if you've got input data coming in, right, and you write it out to disk, it has to be read back out again before it goes out, okay? And that, well, for example, this one is a simple thing. You read data from an S3 bucket, you upload it to another bucket, okay? But you're doing that. That's a performance hit. Why write it to disk only to read it back out again? Also, you've got a limit, 512 megabytes of disk space. If you want to do a bigger file, you can't. What you can do instead is keep it all in memory. And for this, in Python, I use this cool thing. It's called uh, spool temporary files. You know, if you use the temp file, that's a built-in function, by the way, it's awesome. Basically, you can treat it like a regular file on disk, but it's actually existing in memory. And you're gonna get a high performance gain out of this, right? Kind of cool. And now you got a maximum of 3,008 megabytes because that's the maximum. You don't really have 3,008, it's like a slightly smaller than that, but you get a much bigger, uh, size of disk to play around with than the 512 that Lambda gives you. Okay, so what's the performance gain? So for this one, I used AWS X-Ray. Uh, AWS X-Ray is another cool thing. You can actually put it in your Lambda function and then you can time bits of code or chunks of your code or even every API call to how fast it runs. In this particular case, I am reading a 100 megabyte file and uploading the same 100 megabyte file between two S3 buckets, okay? Um, and you can see, well, that there's a huge difference in performance. So if you do it like 10 times, it's 12.3 seconds in memory. So reading the 100 megabyte file 10 times and writing it out 10 times versus 17 seconds on disk, right? So there is some gain to be had by just doing that, by just treating the, the memory that you have as disk. Makes all perfect sense. So but remember, remember, let the platform do the work. In your on-prem solution, this was the only way you could do it. Like you got this file and then in an NFS store, you had to read it in, you're parsing it out, and then you take the bits of data you need. But S3 is not just a NFS store, it's much more than that. So if you wanna read a big file, like 100 megabytes or 200 megabytes, or even more than that, don't read it into the Lambda and parse it. It's very easy to do JSON and CSV parsing, we all know how to do it, but that's not the way we should do it. We should use S3 select or Athena. S3 select is awesome. Basically lets you run SQL query on a CSV file. If you've got a big CSV file, you don't want to pass it. You just upload it to S3 and you run S3 select on it. Athena is the same thing, but it runs over multiple files. So you can have 10 CSV files. You want to treat them all as a single database table, load them into an S3 bucket, run Athena on them, and then take the data that you need into your Lambda function. These things run faster than Lambda. They may not be as responsive, but it runs much faster. This is a much better way of doing it. Now, you might say, well, that's all good for memory and disk. Well, what about cores? What about cores, right? So let's take a look at cores. Cores is quite amazing. <clears throat> Your Lambda function can be configured. Remember we said the memory size, right? So you got a memory size of 120 megabytes up to 3,008 megabytes. You can set it increments of 64 all the way. Cool. At the lowest end of the scale, 128 megabytes, you get 7% vCPU. I know this because at 1792 megabytes, that magic number, you get a full vCPU. Okay, so you do some mathematics, it's linear, it's great. After 1792, you start getting more CPU, but that's multi-core, that's two cores inside this thing now. So what can we do with this knowledge? This is AWS documentation, by the way, this is gospel truth. So what can we do? If, sorry, <laughs> seeing the wrong thing, guys, sorry. So how, the question is, how can we multi-proc in a Lambda, right? If you sort of say 1792, after that, you get more than one CPU, it makes no sense to exceed 1792 unless you are running multi-proc or multi-threading applications. 
If you run a single threaded application, yeah, you can get some performance, but only up to 1792. Anything more than that is a waste of time because you're getting multiple cores but not using it. That's what you're getting. So the question is, how do you multi-proc in a Lambda? Okay. Now, Lambda, like I said, is actually a very low-privileged environment. You come in as a user, you don't have access to a bunch of stuff, and you cannot run multiprocessing queue or multiprocessing pool inside this thing. You can run, though, multiprocessing pipe. I, I don't know why it's some you know, ancient Linux knowledge or whatever, but you can't. You've got only one option of doing multiprocessing in a Lambda. This is how the code roughly looks like, but this is how the performance looks. So it's quite intuitive, right? You look at that. Um, the more, so the light green line is single-threaded, the darker green line is multi-threaded, okay? And we, as you go further along the axis, it's a bigger and bigger lambda function. At 5112, they're both slow, 1008 both slow, 1792, they're still the same speed, multi-thread and single-thread. But after that, only the multi-thread gets faster. Anything above 1792, you better make sure you've got your multi-threading on. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time, you're wasting money, because you're not getting any performance gain. Not in Python anyway, maybe in Go or something like that, but not in Python. Okay, this is a compute heavy job. This is, uh, what is this? Um, okay, 1 million iterations of pbkdf2, password based key derivation function number two. But it's very compute heavy basically. This is a compute heavy job running two threads or a single thread, right? And this is the difference. But Lambda, we just saw, everything runs over the network. So maybe there's some performance gain to be had if you run a network intensive job. And the answer is, yeah, you know, this is writing 100 items into a DynamoDB table, okay? And again, in serverless world, you know, you're writing to DynamoDB, but you're not using ODBC or anything like that. You're actually using REST calls. Underneath the hood, it's all REST calls going and sending out this information. So basically, writing 100 items is probably 100 REST calls that's happening to DynamoDB's API. At the lower end of the scale, the multi-threading in incurs an overhead cost and there's just not much CPU time to go around. So single threading beats multi-threading on lower, on lower size lambdas. Once you get at even 1024, remember we still don't have a full core, multi-threading is faster. Because you know, as one rest call is made, they can switch context, make the other rest call and do that. So multi-threading actually can save you even before 1792 provided the nature of the job that you're running, network intensive versus compute intensive, and most of the time it's somewhere in between. So how do you decide what's the best you know, um, tuning you can do for your function? How do you decide that? Well, there's this really cool tool, tool and it's about 48 hours old, so they just released it. It's actually based on a much older tool, which is awesome. It's called PowerTune. And what PowerTune does is you just say, well, PowerTune, here's a Lambda function. Please you know, run it across different Lambda sizes. It will do that and will tell you how fast it runs and how much it costs. Now remember with Lambda, right? Lambda charges you per gigabyte second of execution. But if you, if you allocate 2x more resources and it executes in half the time, you pay the same amount of money, exactly the same. If you allocate 10x resources and it, and it executes in 10x less time, you again pay the same amount of money, only thing now it's 10x faster, just because you tuned that value. If you allocate 10x resources and it runs at 9.8 times faster, yeah, not there, you're gonna pay a little bit more, but you got 10x performance increase for a 2% increase of cost, right? It's the one place where this is possible. You couldn't do this in like server, like EC2, if you gave an, a big instance, you're gonna pay a lot more than if you had a small instance. That's the only way you could gain more performance. But in Lambda, you can tune it so that you could actually get performance and save money at the same time. It's pretty awesome. But, but, <laughs> writing 100 lines of code into DynamoDB is not the best way of doing it, 100 lines of items. Yeah? Uh, you, there is actually something called batch writer, and almost every AWS SDK endpoint has this. You batch them up so that it goes in one REST call and it gets you better performance. So if you're reading stuff off SQS or you're writing stuff to or from uh, DynamoDB, batching them up at the SDK level is going to get you even better performance than any multi-threading or any multi-proc is going to get you. That's how good it is, right? So batch is that yellow line at the bottom way better at all sizes, okay? But remember, let the platform do the work. Don't worry about you know, multi-threading and fiddling your way inside the Lambda function. Maybe you can do that to save some edge case cost or whatever. Lambda is built to be spun up multiple times. You're, it's built to be basically spun up like a thousand times in a row. No problem, you can handle that, no issues, right? Because at the end of the day, you pay for when it runs and when it dies, you stop paying, zero. So how do you spin up like a thousand Lambda functions to do your work, 
Maybe you want to, let's say, hash, hash a thousand files in an S3 bucket. You want to get the hash of a thousand files in an S3 bucket. How do you do that? How do you spin them up? How do you monitor them? How do you run exception handling on them? Right? There are many ways to do this, but this is my favorite. Uh, I use SQS queues, right? So let's say you have a thousand files you want to hash. You just dump the payload. Don't dump the, don't dump the file content, dump the pointer to the file as a payload to SQS queue. Underneath the hood, you tell every time a, a message or a payload comes in this queue, spin a Lambda function. And AWS will do that for you. We'll actually pull the SQS queue for you and spin up the Lambda functions. The more messages you dump onto the queue, the more polars they spin up and the faster you ramp up. You will scale very nicely and gradually, right? So the Lambda polars help you with scaling. That's amazing, okay? But better yet, you can tell SQS, look, try to run the Lambda twice, and if it fails two times in a row, drop it in the dead letter queue. So you create a dead letter queue, and then that helps you with your exception handling and retries, right? That's the dead letter queue there. Okay, so then you say, okay, mm, how about this? But the real beauty of this entire thing is the SQS queue itself, because there you can actually monitor. If you dumped 10,000 payloads into SQS queue, okay, and now you find there's only 5,000 left, you know 5,000 have been processed. You can figure out how many are invisible. Invisible basically means, in this context, that there is a Lambda function working on that payload right now. Visible means that it hasn't been processed yet. You can monitor the invocations of your Lambda with one call to an SQS queue. You can do this with CloudWatch logs if you want, but it's not very good and there's a delay. SQS queue in this way is the perfect way to spin up thousands of Lambda functions. Now, if you spin up thousands of Lambda functions and that hits some you know, legacy database, that's going to crash the database. So what you can also do is set concurrency of the Lambda. So remember the concurrency we set up in the demo? So if you set 10, the maximum Lambda functions that are going to spin up are 10. And this way you can say, I've dumped you know, a million payloads into SQS queue, but I put a concurrency limit of, let's say, 20. And only 20 Lambda functions are going to be spun up at any one time, and your database is going to get a bit hit by 20 Lambda functions. That's awesome, man. The last bit, if you don't have that limitation and you wanted to really spin this up, how do you actually corral back that information, right? You could have all these Lambda functions write to DynamoDB. It's a little bit expensive, but it can work. Or you can have them all write to an S3 bucket and use Athena to read them all, right? In the serverless world, you always have to consume these services. Just because Lambda is general compute doesn't mean you have to do it in Lambda. Cool. So in conclusion, the, uh, using Lambda in memory is faster than disk, only slightly. I wouldn't recommend it if you don't want to do it, but there's a way to get that extra bit of performance by using memory only versus disk. You know? If you want to query files in S3, don't read them into your Lambda and process them. Use S3 Select or Athena. Right? Um, you can multi-trade in a Lambda, and you know, it talks about 1792. That's the perfect number. That's the number you have to remember. 1792 equals to one core on Lambda. Um, but because everything is over the network, you can get performance increase even by multi-trading under that limit, right? Um, but always remember, let the platform do the work. The platform can scale it up for you. You don't have to work it on, right? So one of the beauties of Lambda is you give, it, you give that work to the platform and you write business logic in, in your system. Okay, right. So strong with Lambda you are, but let's get even deeper into the Lambda function. Let's talk about what software this thing runs. Well, it's an Amazon product. Of course, it's going to run Amazon Linux. It's, uh, I think it's based on CentOS. It uses uh, Yum, okay? There's a whole bunch of other stuff there. I'll just bypass all of that. But here we go. This is an important one. Every Lambda function comes prepackaged with Boto3. Not the recent version of Boto3, but a version of Boto3. And you can use it if you want, but I don't recommend it. It also comes packaged with some binaries. Um, awk, curl, tar, MD5 some, but not others, like, okay? If you want to know what's in a Lambda and what version specifically, so if you've got a very specific version of OpenSSL you've got to use and you want to find out what version is in uh, um, Lambda, you can do that. That's a hot tip. That's a Docker container. LambCI are guys that work with AWS to give you these containers that precisely mimic AWS Lambda. Right, so you can use these containers to play around before you deploy or really get a look at what's inside the Lambda function. Okay, that's all boring. Next, SysPath. Okay. So SysPath is where Python looks for packages, right? So all of what we talked about before, how do you bring an external package to the party? Let's say I want to use requests in my Lambda. How do I do it? Many ways to do it. Um, you could put your package in any one of these three directories. Those three directories are user-supplied. 
So var slash task is where you upload your, let's say, function artifact. Um, and opt is where you would put layers, right? Boto tree is there. So if you provide a Boto tree in any of those top three layers, it's going to override the Boto tree in Lambda. Now, I don't know why they repeat opt, <laughs> but it is repeated, okay? But let's talk about how you want to bring external packages to a Lambda. Now, in serverless, you can do this quite easily with the serverless framework. You just use, you know, serverless Python requirements. Yeah, okay. Now, it works quite good, and it's actually a pretty slick, pretty awesome um, plugin for the, for, for the framework. What it does is this. It basically, if you run a non-Linux build machine, so normally your laptops are not Linux, right? So it does this way, pops out the container, takes your requirements TXT, build the packages there, brings it back, and pushes that on to, to Lambda as a full artifact, right? But your build pipelines, 99% of the time, are running on Linux. So they don't need to do this. They will actually build it in the container itself, without the container, right? Just build it. But the point is that this is not an accurate representation of how it looks like. This is an accurate representation of how it looks like. The packages are much, much larger than your code, right? Request is like, what, 800 plus kilobytes, maybe 400 kilobytes if you slim it down. But your Lambda code probably isn't anywhere close to that. So why, why do that this way, right? You're, keeping up, you're basically reloading and uploading and deploying a lot of code that is pretty much static. My favorite way of doing this is taking those packages and having a separate deploy pipeline to deploy them as layers. And then when you deploy your code, you reference those layers so that it gets packaged as a single artifact, okay? And in a little bit of a shameless self-promotion, <laughs> so I got this, uh, whoa, okay, I got this GitHub repo, and in this repo, there's about 55, 56, I think, uh, Python packages available as publicly available uh, layers. So you can just reference the layer without building it, without Docker, without anything, and just say, I want to use request in this function, reference that layer, and you will be able to use request in your function when you run a Lambda. So at this point, you might be thinking, oh, well, what's a layer? <laughs> well, a layer is a, a pretty simple concept, actually. Um, what it actually is in one slide is this. It's a zip function that gets extracted out into the opt directory of your Lambda function. That's it. But op slash bin is in your path. Op slash lib is in your library path and op slash Python is in your sys path. So if you've got a binary and a library that the binary depends on, put the binary in a bin folder, put the library in the lib folder, zip that up, upload it as a layer, and then your Lambda function can access it like any other binary on the file system. If you've got an external package, put that into a Python folder, zip it up, and use that as a layer. That's all a layer is. It allows you to abstract out bits of your code into nice chunks, especially the parts that remain static, and you use that to deploy. You might be asking, is there a performance hit? Will Lambda like build it as it's deploying the layer? Well, no, it actually statically builds it. This is Chris Munns. He's like some AWS developer advocate, I think, um, basically telling you, well, no, it doesn't happen. But we know it doesn't happen not because he tells us. We know it doesn't happen because if you use my layer and I delete my layer, your function still runs. Your function has a static copy inside it. You won't be able to deploy a new function or update that function, but it's not a runtime dependency. It's a build or deploy time dependency. So that's roughly how it works. Now, a note about Boto3. Boto3 is Amazon's SDK thing. Basically, a Lambda function without Boto3 doesn't have much use. Boto3 is how you communicate with everything in AWS, and I mean everything. <laughs> um, it's one of the most unstable packages. And not unstable like it's buggy, but unstable like AWS make a release to that thing two, three times a week. Because every time they release a new service or a new function or a new feature, they update Boto3 so that you can access it via Boto3. The version that's packaged in Lambda is like 100 versions behind what is current. Okay? So you've got to be worried about that. So my personal preference is to always bring Boto3 to the party. Package Boto3 as a layer or in your function code, but bring your own Boto3 and don't rely on the Boto3 inside Lambda. Because one day, one day, it has never happened, but maybe one day, AWS will make a breaking change to both the three and it's going to break your code. Okay? So that's cool. We're at the end. Um, what we didn't cover, there's so many things we didn't cover. The thing that I so, was so disappointed we couldn't cover was step functions. Step functions is really how you up your Lambda game, and it is awesome. Lambdas run for 15 minutes maximum, then they die. Step functions can last for a year, and you can chain up multiple Lambda functions with multiple runtimes and everything else. We didn't cover Lambda at Edge. You can do that in Python, right? Uh, Lambda integration, custom runtime, so many things we didn't cover. <laughs> but it's cool. 
The last thing, uh, this is the last slide, by the way. So Python 2.7, beware, my friends, if you use Python 2.7 in your Lambda. When Node 6 was deprecated, AWS deprecated it on the same day, on the same day of deprecation. And I wish that it did the same. So that means 2020, they're going to deprecate 2.7 Lambdas. What deprecation means is roughly this. They give you a 60 day grace period, and then they prevent you from creating new functions. Then another 60 days, and then they prevent you from updating functions. So if you've got a node seven function lying around, you can't update it or change it anymore. It's static. And at some point you're gonna say you can't even run it anymore. Okay? So if you've got Lambda code running on 2.7, and I hope AWS has to do this, just so that it gives us some predictability of what's gonna to happen to 3.6 and 3.7 when those come along, is I hope they deprecate it on the same day and you got solved. So if you've got a lot of Lambda code running on 2.7, it's really time you look at, you could hack your way around this by having a custom Python 2.7 runtime. I wouldn't recommend it, but you know, just beware that it's coming, yeah? And with that, it's the end. So thank you everybody. Any questions? Do you have any questions? Uh, I'm using Lambda now. Yep. So I noticed there's a deployment package limit, right? Yes, 250 megabytes. Uh, 50 megabytes, the zip file has to be 50, and when it unzips, it has to be 250. Cannot, that's a hard limit. Oh, okay, okay. You download it at runtime. Is that right? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah technically you could. <laughs> okay, you could do that. You could download it at runtime, yeah. <laughs> do you have any more questions? Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.